it's great to see all of you uh, to be here today. I always uh, say to my staff that uh, when I get frustrated sometimes in Kiev, the best thing to do is just to go to a university and speak to a group of students because I always come away excited and uh, rejuvenated, full, uh, full of hope. And uh, I told, uh, told that to Milan, so she's going to be the one to do all of the hard work today to speak to you, but uh, it really is a pleasure for me to be here and uh, to join her at this great university. Uh, I do believe very much in the importance of education in terms of changing societies, and I think that uh, this university and all of you and the faculty here, Father Boris, Bishop Boris, uh, have done a terrific job in lighting the way for uh, the future of education in this, uh, in this country, and it's my honor uh, on occasion to do what I can to be supportive of what, uh, what you all are trying to do. <clears throat> it's really a very special day for me, but also for you, because you get to hear today uh, a woman who I have great, great admiration for. And I'm not just saying that because I'm standing up here introducing her. Uh, Milan Verveer, uh, I'm not going to read the whole bio, but Milan Verveer has had a distinguished career both in and out of government. She was Chief of Staff to Mrs. Clinton when she was First Lady. She founded a group called Vital Voices, which is one of the premier women's NGOs uh, in the world that continues to function. Uh, and it was no surprise to any of us that uh, President Obama selected her four years ago to be the first coordinator for global women's programs in uh, the State Department. What she has done over the last four years is uh, tremendous. She has crisscrossed the globe, and I, I won't even ask her to tell you how many miles she has logged. Secretary Clinton, you know, does a lot of travel, but she gets to ride in this fancy government airplane. Milan, Milan has to go fight through the airports, just like all of the rest of us have to do. And she's been to every continent, and she's done really superb work to try, try to promote the role of women in society, not just in and of itself, but because women, studies increasingly show, are critical to the development, to the economic development of, of uh, certainly developing societies and societies that are evolving political institutions, building democracy and rule of law as Ukraine is. So it is really my great pleasure today to introduce to you a great American, uh, my friend, Milan Revere. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Teft, for being here with me uh, and with all of us. Uh, he is a great friend of Ukraine, a great friend of mine, and he has done uh, extraordinary work, uh, not just here in this country, but throughout his diplomatic career. He has exemplified the best uh, of American diplomacy. It is truly wonderful for me to be back in Ukraine, uh, to be in this beautiful city, and to have the special honor, finally, to be at the Ukrainian Catholic University. I have been wanting to come here for some time, and uh, finally that is realized. Бабуси и дідуси, как мами нои, и с дідуси, и с батькови, и с стороне, народилися в Україні. And this country has always been a special place for me, and has always had a special place in my heart. My grandparents came to the United States from this region in the first wave of immigration from Ukraine at the turn of the century, more than a hundred years ago. And as a child growing up during the Cold War in a Ukrainian-American family, singing Stendamedla Ukraina, we were ever mindful of the oppression experienced by the Ukrainian people. But we, like Ukrainians here, believed that freedom would one day triumph. There are many links between the United States and Ukraine. 
not least of which are the million Ukrainian Americans. However, the strongest link is the values that we share. And I am so happy to be able to come back after the first visit I made to Lviv, which was with Hillary Clinton when she was First Lady of the United States. That visit took place in 1996, just a few years after Ukraine became independent. And as she said then, even in the face of unspeakable horrors, the people of Ukraine living under Soviet domination did not give up. Instead, you found the best field shield against oppression. You started down the road to democracy. And even then, over 15 years ago, when many in this room were very young, we felt that commitment to democracy in all the people we met here. And I remember well, as though it were just yesterday, when we were welcomed at St. George's Cathedral by a very impressive young theologian who was not yet ordained a priest. He was someone you all know very well, Boris Gudziak. Even then, he was engaged in service to people with very special needs, which I know continues to this day at this great university. And being at the cathedral with him and having him tell us the history that transpired for the church, uh, the struggle against oppression that was experienced by the Ukrainian Catholic Church, which through those times became the Church of the New Martyrs and for several decades had to go underground. You have come from a place that wit witnessed the worst in humanity to a place today that is extends that circle of humanity. This university is tied to the history of that struggle. Today, you have the distinction of being the first Catholic university to open on the territory of the former Soviet Union, and the first university of the Eastern Catholic Church. And since the establishment of UCU a decade ago, you have become a center of academic excellence. <coughs> you are recognized for rigorous intellectual standards, for ethical principles, for a moral vision, a spirit of community, a place where future leaders are being formed and nurtured. Bishop Boris once described UCU this way. He said, it is a center for cultural thought and formation of a new Ukrainian society, one based on human dignity a place breathing in the winds of freedom with full lungs and the hunger to make a path for the future. I had the opportunity to tour the other part of the campus yesterday and to meet with some of the distinguished leaders of this university who are here this morning. And I believe that what is occurring here is truly a transformative experience, uh, not just for everyone involved in this institution, uh, but for this country. Tara Shevchenko wrote, in your house you will find them, truth, strength, and freedom. And I believe that in Ukraine, they are found here at UCU. So let me not leave here today without extending my congratulations also to the new apostolic Eckhart. Bishop Boris is not with us today because he is in the United States. He is there to grow support 
for this university to which he has been so devoted. And I have no doubt that he will continue to be engaged in every way he can uh, in his new position. I come back to your country at a defining moment, a crossroad in the life of your young democracy. As the United States government has noted, the recent parliamentary campaign and the elections were a step backwards for Ukraine's democracy. They were riddled with irregularities, with the falsification of results in some places, with intimidation in other places, with the diversion of government resources to benefit ruling party candidates, as well as the politically motivated conviction and imprisonment of opposition leaders like Yulia Tymoshenko through selective prosecutions that kept them from competing in the election. And as you all know so well, it wasn't that long ago that Bishop Boris and this university were warned about students' participation in protests. If this had not been stopped, it would be the kind of harassment that could undermine democratic values, religious liberty, academic freedom, and human rights. But I think what we should do today is take heart at what Bishop Boris said then, because I think it is a guidepost for today. He said, we can do more than we think we can. This is not the first time we are in a crisis. It is not the first time Ukraine is in this condition. The current situation is not only one of challenges and dangers, but a huge opportunity. And it is this opportunity that I want to speak to you about today. Two ways that I believe each and every one of you can truly make a difference. First, the call to citizenship. You know, democracy has been described as a messy business. It requires patience, hard work, constant nurturing, and vigilance. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen, happen just by wishing for it. Democracy is who we are and how we live our lives. It is the values that the French political thinker, Alex de Tocqueville, observed when he was in the United States in the earliest days of our history. And as he saw people doing the kinds of things to help each other, he called them the habits of the heart. The habits of the heart to be passed from one generation to another. Now, when my grandparents came to America from Ukraine all those years ago, they brought with them the values of service to community. They brought a belief in a better tomorrow, a strong faith, and an optimistic spirit that enabled them and their fellow Ukrainians to establish the first Ukrainian self-help organization in the United States. They were, in my view, true civil society leaders. They were agents of change. And each generation is called to meet the challenges of its times. You students at UCU are among the best and the brightest of your generation. You will be the young professionals and the civic activists like those I have met here in Ukraine on this trip and those that I have met on all my previous visits here. So many inspirational activists and committed citizens 
who are promoting tolerance, supporting women's equality and human rights, fighting against corruption, advancing religious freedom, struggling to establish democratic institutions and ensure that they work, and the rule of law, which is so critical to any democracy. Others are supporting entrepreneurs, economic reforms. They are mentoring others who are coming up the ranks, working with people like all of you with special needs, and so much more. Where would this country be without all of these efforts? Ukraine has accomplished much in the last 20 years of independence, but there is still so much work to be done. And as you look forward, the decisions of your government will not only determine the future of this country, but it will have a great deal to say about your own future. Secretary Clinton has reminded us that societies move forward when citizens are empowered to transform common interests into common actions that serve the common good. A healthy democracy depends on a healthy civil society. It depends on each and every one of us and I hope you will seize the opportunity to do all that you can in the months and years ahead. I also hope, secondly, that you will advance women's equality. The status of women in Ukraine and around the world is not only a matter of morality and justice, but it is an economic, social, and political imperative. Because until women here and around the world are accorded the rights that they have as human beings and afforded the opportunities to participate fully in our societies, the economic and political life of their countries, progress and prosperity, both here and everywhere else, will have its own glass ceiling. Because as Ambassador Teff said, the evidence, the studies, the data, today is irrefutable. When women are free to develop their talents and fulfill their God-given potentials, all of society benefits. A nation's progress depends also on the progress of its women. And a democracy without the participation of women is a contradiction. When women's participation in elective office at every level, the local level, the oblast level, the national level, when that is restricted, we are not only shortchanging women, we are depriving our society of the benefits of their talents, their experiences, and their perspectives that are so important to good government and the kind of public policies that affect every member of society that come out of government decisions. I find it disappointing that only 13% of the candidates in the parliamentary elections from the major parties were women. But in Kiev the other night, just before we got on the plane to come here to Lviv, I met with three female parliamentarians from three different parties. They had come together to form a parliamentary women's caucus that despite all the differences they hold on certain issues, because of their party allegiances, they were coming together to focus on issues that might not otherwise be addressed, crossing their divisions to make a difference 
for the common good. And just before coming here, we met with the governor of this oblast, and he went out of his way with pride to tell us about the women who were holding uh, top positions in the administrative districts of this oblast, including one woman who met with us who is uh, in charge of the area uh, that, in fact, is the mining area. And she is doing an excellent job. This is how we have to tap the potential of all of our people. Further, it is both discriminatory and dispiriting when political leaders make statements about women that put them down, that are demeaning, and are disrespectful. It is also the case that a vibrant economy depends on the full contributions of women to start and grow small and medium-sized businesses, to participate in the workforce. In so doing, they not only earn income that they need for themselves and their families, but they grow the economies and create jobs in their countries. And today we know so much more about how women's participation positively correlates with a country's prosperity and economic competitiveness. Before I came to Ukraine, I was in Warsaw, where my government was sponsoring a conference for women entrepreneurs from this region from Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, Poland. And why were we doing that? It was called Invest for the Future, because we knew it is an investment for the future to enable women to overcome the hurdles that they experience in starting or growing businesses. Hurdles like access to credit or markets or the training and mentoring that they need so they can be successful. This is why the World Bank says that gender equality is smart economics. And at a time when this country confronts severe economic challenges, it cannot make the progress it needs to make if its women are not fully participating. And when women are free from violence, when human trafficking and exploitation are prevented, when women's rights are protected, nations are more stable and secure. We can never condone violence against women. It is not a private matter. It is not a cultural matter. It is not the way things are. It is criminal. And perpetrators of this kind of violence need to be prosecuted. The position that I have in my government is unprecedented for our country. President Obama and Secretary Clinton created this position because for them it reflects and reinforces the importance of women's issues for United States foreign policy. We cannot possibly tackle or certainly solve the many challenges that confront our country, our world, whether they have to do with security, with the environment, with economics, with governance, whatever, unless women are participating at every level of society. So women's issues aren't just for women. They're really everybody's issues. And I hope they will be a concern for you as you go forward and take your places in the positions that you will hold in this country. Because remember, no country can get ahead. Not the United States, not Ukraine, no country, if it leaves half of its people behind and does not tap the potentials that they have. You know, it's been said that some people see things as they are. 
and there are a lot of things that are concerning. They wring their hands, they despair, and they ask why. Why is this happening? But there are other people who look at the same situation as Bishop Boris said, and these are the opportunities for them because they look at the situation and they say, why not? They have a vision of what could be, just as the founders of this university, against all odds and perhaps naysayers, had a vision and went to work to ensure that vision became a reality. You are the not-so-ordinary people who I believe will do extraordinary things to make a difference for your country. You are the why not people, not those who say it can't be done. And I want you to know that the United States remains committed to assisting Ukraine as we have over the last 20 years on your path to strengthening your democracy. Know that we continue to walk with you on this journey. You have been and must continue to be that moral force that bends the arc of history to moral justice. To echo the words of your national anthem, your persistence and sincere toils will be rewarded, and as a result, freedom's song will resound throughout Ukraine. Shtenna medla Ukraina, ni slava, ni voya. Slava Ukraini. We wish you all the best, and Godspeed.